Hello? Hello? How are you? <laughs> I'm fine. Wow, are you in a different room there? Or? Yeah, yeah, I moved to a different room. I usually don't have a room available at this time, so... <laughs> oh, okay. I fixed up this room and I could move across the room <clears throat> to another computer, but... Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I built a shelf. For what? I have For part, of, part of it pre-made, but... Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, it, it's been a, quite the project. Nothing fit. Oh. <laughs> it's like one of the prefabricated ones, or...? Yeah, a uh, few parts prefabricated. I made the fourth part, and, and then there was a... A top that they made for me that was too long and too too shallow in two directions. Yeah. So I got to alter the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I have with one of the papers that I sent you. Um, I had. I, I need to show this. Okay. Uh, I'll try it out. Um, see. There we go. Um, that's better. And then you pull on it. What oh, okay. happens when you pull on it? So this is, I think that's what they're trying to describe. But I, I keep reading that paper because it was so convoluted. So I was wondering if it was just that. Oh. <laughs> that you did the show then saying that things intercalated and then they went out to the side and then it was sort of a, Feedback loop. Well, yes, I guess you could call it sort of a feedback loop. I don't know what you think. Hmm. Is, is that a feedback loop? <laughs> well, yeah, we can talk about that. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> um, welcome, everyone. Uh, I see, yeah, Mojwal and Minoc and Mayuk are here. Yeah, so uh, welcome to the meeting. This is, I think, the final meeting of the year. Um, I, uh, I have a couple things I want to talk about. Uh, I have an uh, update on the periodicity in the embryo paper. Uh, Susan had some paper she wanted to talk about. Um, well, not really, but oh, the, we can, the one, mostly. Yeah, we can talk about the one. And then we can talk about some other things, uh, maybe some things for the upcoming year. And then, um, then next year, you know, early in January, I'll present on uh, like a recap of 2020. we will kind of go over where we are and, and that'll g include like a lot of the Devo Learn stuff and the uh, other things that we've been doing this year. We've, I did this in my other group this last week, but I'll do it like in the new year for this group. Uh, it's always good to keep stock of where you've been and where you are and like some of the things that you've accomplished in the group. I think that's, a, and you've, if you look back you know, over like a 12 month period, it's actually quite impressive sometimes what happens over that time instead of just like, you know, what did I do last week? And um, anyways, and then maybe a plan out for the new year. Um, I talked yesterday, I talked to Heidi Hutner from Open Worm and she, um, uh, we were talking about like educational opportunities. So, you know, there's a move, I think, uh, between her and myself and maybe Steven Larson is going to be back active again in, in Open Worm to sort of revitalize some of the educational outreach stuff. Um, so, you know, we've been at the Open Worm level, we've been trying to do this for a while, trying to like uh, do some outreach education, uh, you know, see Elegans related. And then we've done stuff in this group with like machine learning and tutorials and she wants to actually take that a step further and like build a, you know, uh, almost like a, an educational platform for people who might be interested, say, in uh, computational skills, but they don't, you know, they need to learn like new programming languages or new techniques or whatever. And then, uh, but using the worm or, you know, computational biology as a way around 
way towards that. So, I mean, that might be an interesting thing. Maybe this summer we'll be doing some of that. So, hopefully. Hi, Dick. So, yeah, if, if you're interested in that, let me know. Um, it's pretty early, so we, I'll be talking about it again. So, Susan, did you have, you were going to talk about those pa that paper? Oh, you're muted, Susan. Susan, you're muted. <laughs> okay. okay, it's not up at the top with the picture. It's at the bottom of the screen. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so this is actually Dick's idea. And um, the title of the paper is Mechanical Coupling Coordinates the Co-Elongation of axial and paraxial tissue in avian embryos. So I would like to know a little bit more about how avian embryos operate. Um, but this was giving me a headache to read. So um, they're, they're suggesting that the tissue at the sides of the um, neural um, tube um, go to the side and feedback into the lengthening um, neural neural tube. Anyway, sort of it's an elongation of the embryo or part of it. And after reading it, I thought, well, this is this is to you, Dick. See, there's there's a rubber band, and if you pull on it, it does that. They all do. So there there you go. That that's probably what's happening or what they're trying to describe by the intercalation of cells, etc. So, um, um, the verbal part of that was a bit much for me. <laughs> <laughs> and the other paper that I, I had is just a description. Oh, Susan? Of, yeah? Yeah, <clears throat> that's not original with me. The idea goes back to papers around 1900. Oh, okay. All right. Yep. All right. Nineteen hundred. Oh, I guess I uh, I yeah, love the reference. <laughs> but okay. But that's kind of what I think they're trying to describe in that paper. Okay. And they said it's a feedback loop. Well, it sort of is. It's mechanically what happens when you stretch stretch something. Um. And then I had the other paper. Uh, was about stem cell niches and um, how if you push and pull the stem cells to uh, they become uh, another type of tissue and then what uh, are some of the protein markers that occur while this is happening. So it was kind of a nice, I thought it was sort of a review paper but I haven't gone through it thoroughly so I can't can't really talk about it because it's just that's what I think it is. Yeah. So it's you know, mechanical forces direct stem cell behavior in development and regeneration, and they're they're trying to um, apply forces to stem cells to see if what happens <laughs> and see if that's uh, if they can replace those forces, which with what's happening in the embryo as a whole and it's always better if you can keep it the embryo intact of course but they're trying to take it apart the other way yeah anyway that's that that's the two papers yeah let me see if i have uh, i think i have the papers in the collection here um, let me check the folder um sure if this is it no. I may not have put them in here but it's called mechanical um, mechanical anyway the the ridges of the uh, neuro tube to close close the um, brain cavity and the uh, spinal cord um, 
part of the force comes from the tension of the elongation, like their the notochord is is growing and pulling on the tissue and it, and it naturally folds. It's just a, what happens with elastic tissue. So yeah, just a, thought I should point that out with that <laughs> deeper because the um, like I say the verbal description is a uh, um, made my eyes cross. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes yeah papers can do that. But uh, yeah, that's good. Thank you. I don't think I have the paper in that uh, collection of papers. I know you sent them to me, but I didn't. I don't know if I put them in the folder, right folder. So yeah, that's good. I think that's a pretty good description. Um, thank you for that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, I'll find the bottom. There we go. I'll, I'll shut myself off again. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's good. Um, so, uh, I don't know if we could jump, maybe, maybe we can, oh, here's Shruti. Hello? Maybe we can jump into papers, uh, since I had that folder out. So let me present now. All right. You can see my, yeah, I can see my screen coming up here. So I had a bunch of things to talk about this week. Um. So the first thing is that there's this workshop, Synthetic Morphogenesis, from Gene Circuits to Tissue Architecture. And it's coming up in the uh, early March period. It's put on by EMBL. It's a, uh, a virtual conference or workshop. And I think it does cost some money. So I don't know if you're, you know, if you don't think it's worth your, you know, the money that they're asking, then you don't have to attend. I don't know if they're going to have the lectures online afterwards uh, but uh, it looks like there's a, there are a lot of good speakers here um, and they're going to be talking about different t uh, topics in this area uh, I don't really know what the what the agenda looks like yet so they you know if you go to this website you'll find you can find out more uh, I was thinking of maybe submitting something to this but we'll see um, probably something maybe we're doing already but if you have a good idea for that uh let me know i think that would be an interesting you know i don't know if we would get accepted because when they say you know from gene circuits to tissue architecture it's hard to know what they're looking for it looks like they have a mechanical hummingbird here but i don't know what if that means that that's just like an artistic styling or they're really interested in like virtual uh you know things about you know modeling and things like that so i'm not really sure what the sort of the uh perspective is because sometimes you know people will have maybe a more biological perspective or a more computational perspective and that'll affect what they're really looking for but it might be good at, you know it might be something if we can submit an abstract by the 6th of january see if it gets accepted uh it's just one opportunity um so there's that. Uh, I think this was the one. Bradley. Yeah. I hate to put a damper on it, but uh, the uh, web page says registration closed. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it says, and your registration was uh, February 24th, so I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Well, anyways, I, I, I've been talking actually with my other group about like putting together a list of deadlines. Um, that's another thing we might do uh, is, you know, if we find opportunities online or wherever, if we get like, you know, things that float around uh, to make like a list, a common list of deadlines. So if, you know, maybe if you find something interesting, put it on the list, I, I'll, I can make a list you know, um, and we can review it on a regular basis. And, you know, that'll help. Like if something is coming up, we can prepare for it. And includes like um, special paper deadlines as well, if we want to do something like that. So, um, okay, so the other thing, one other thing I wanted to talk about was not this one. 
Okay, so this is a paper I found. Uh, Animal egg is evolutionary innovation. A solution to the embryonic hourglass puzzle. This is by Stuart A. Newman. I think we've encountered this person before. Um, the abstract says, the evolutionary origin of the egg stage of animal development presents several difficulties for conventional developmental and evolutionary narratives. If the egg's internal organization represents a template for key features of the developed organism, why can taxa within a given phylum exhibit very different egg types? Pass through a common intermediate morphology, what they call the phylotypic stage, only to diverge again, thus exemplifying the embryonic hourglass. And so this is a problem in developmental biology where you get these, uh, you have this phylotypic stage and it's sort of a place where there's a sort of a common morphology between like early, very early embryogenesis and later embryogenesis. So uh, if moreover, if different egg types typically represent adaptations of different environmental conditions, why do birds and mammals, for example, have such vastly different eggs with respect to size, shape, and post-fertilization dynamics, whereas all these features are more similar for ascidians and mammals? So ascidians are like sea uh, uh, marine invertebrates, and of course mammals are, you know, like us or like dogs or cats. And so why is it that those two groups of organisms have features that are more similar than something like birds and uh, birds and mammals, which are actually closer phylogenetically? And so that's the question they're asking there. Uh, here I consider the possibility that different body plans had their origin in self-organizing physical processes in ancient clusters of cells and suggest that eggs represented a set of independent evolutionary innovations subsequently inserted into the developmental trajectories of such aggregates. So last week we talked about a paper Dick um, uh, found on ag cell aggregates and they were doing these experiments uh, with cell aggregates. And so, but this is actually not a trivial thing for experiments. This is actually something that is thought to be like when you go from like single cells to a bunch of uh, multicellular, you know, a multicellular population of cells, like a, you know, an organism that we would call an organism. But when you have this transition from those two types of uh, cell types or, or cell arrangements, you get these aggregates. And so, you know, there's this whole literature on multicellular transitions, if you're interested in it. But this is uh, the, this is kind of what they're kind of getting at here. They're talking about this possibility that different body plans had uh, origin in something to do with like these ancient clusters of cells kind of coming together. Um, next, I describe how adaptive specialization of cells released from such aggregates could have become proto-eggs, which regenerated the parental cell clusters by cleavage, conserving the characteristic DPMs available to a lineage. Then I show how known processes of cytoplasmic reorganization following fertilization are often based on spontaneous self-organizing physical effects, what he calls egg patterning processes. And he gives a acronym EPP, which is, you know, I don't know, people like acronyms. Uh, I suggest that rather than acting as developmental blueprints or pre-patterns, the EPPs refine the phylotypic body plans determined by the DPMs by setting the boundary and initial conditions under which these multicellular patterning mechanisms operate. And so this is the, so this paper kind of goes through, so this is the phylotypic stage here. So what he's talking about is that you have eggs and they're fertilized and there's this sort of diversity of egg shapes we talked about this uh, a while back this year. Um, we talked about, like, I, maybe it wasn't even this year, it was the year before, where they looked at all these different types of eggs that exist in nature, and they were classifying them. Um, I don't know if people remember this paper, but it was a, a science paper, and they had all these different egg shapes, and they were classifying them and looking at the diversity of eggs in nature. And so there's actually quite a uh, diversity of shapes. Um, but anyways, all these different shapes come together and at some point, called the phylotypic stage, 
they have this common morphology. And then this, uh, I guess this is invertebrates, so it's, you know, not totally universal. But then you end up with these different morphologies from rabbits to ducks to turtles and they all, you know, birds and amphibians and mammals. And they all come out of this same sort of hourglass of uh, common shape here, common form. And so, so this is the standard representation of this hourglass model. Um, and then this is an example of differential development here where you have these cell aggregates and then they form into these different eggs. And then this, this shows the developmental trajectory for each of these, you know, you have this, um, so let's see if we can find in, in the bottom here. Um, so this is something they call body plans. So, you know, across, uh, a, across development, you have, you know, only a couple of different types of body plans. And so the body plans represent things like arms and legs or, you know, other types of, you know, other types of uh, segmentation. And so, you know, with, uh, with mammals, you have um, a certain body plan, but in invertebrates, you have another type of body plan. And this is something that, you know, there's a whole literature on body plans or ball plans. And so that's what they're getting at here with this rest of the figure. Um, then he talks about dynamic patterning modules, which is this idea about gene expression being responsible for these different body plans. And so he goes through this here. Um, I'm trying to find if there are any nice figures in this paper. It talks about eggs evolutionary innovations and morphological novelties. So this is where you know, we kind of get into this idea that you're getting eggs from the single, you know, the cell aggregates and that you get these evolu they're actually themselves in evolutionary innovations that they appear in evolution as this thing to solve a problem. Um, so the, the, the paper says once primitive animal body plans have emerged, there would have been a selective premium on starting the developmental sequence, not with a cluster of development, developmentally equivalent cells, but with a cell aggregate that was prepared so that development would proceed in a more reliable fashion. Generally accepted scenarios predict that changes made at the earliest stages of development should have dramatic consequences at later stages. Uh, the fact that such varied changes can occur even in related lineages during the period leading up to gastrulation with little effect on the body plan is the crux of the pre-constriction hourglass puzzle. So this fits into this our uh, developmental hourglass model. Um, so this kind of shows again like this idea of uh, dynamic patterning, how gene expression in different parts of the egg lead to patterning over developmental time. So you get in, in the Drosophila or the, uh, we, we talk, we talk about Drosophila embryos from time to time in this group, uh, the uh, fruit fly, you have these eggs that, um, you know, you get uh, gene expression patterns in different parts of the egg. And over time, these uh, different areas of gene ex differential gene expression from these stripes and then they form banding patterns in the embryo. And then that leads to the pattern, sort of the uh, segments of the body of the, of the fly. So this is uh, sort of laying this out here. I'm just trying to go over this for people who probably aren't very aware of like some of these things in development. Um, so he goes, has a bunch of conclusions and then a lot of literature cited so if you're interested in this paper, you know, you could read more about it. Another paper we had, I think this was from a while back. I think this was Susan that sent this. This is actually a, a news story to this article. Uh, smaller salamander species associated with smaller genomes. So um, this is a salamander and uh, 
So this this type of salamander from the genus Thorius is you know about the size of this coin. So it's not very large. And their statement is is that this salamander must pack enough cells into a tiny form to build a complex physio to build all the complex physiological structures that you find in a salamander. So this is an you know it's an amphibian. It's not like uh, uh, you know it's not like a worm or something where you don't have you know you have all of the structures of a vertebrate packed into this tiny body. So how do they do it? Um, so the world's tiniest salamander is so small that some body parts appear to get the short shrift. Those in the genus Thorius, for example, have heads that are mind-bogglingly small, maybe half the size of a pencil eraser. Uh, so that's actually pretty small. And you think about like the brains that they have, you know, uh, that they have a uh, vertebrate nervous system and they have, uh, you know, so how do they fit this into such a small body? Um, Within this tiny skull, the eyes bulge and the brain is, in relative terms, massive. The teeth in the upper jaw are usually missing entirely. So one way they solve this small size of their body is that they're trade-offs. So you have a brain, you know, the brain can't shrink down to maybe, you know, it's a minimal size, maybe not smaller than that. And so if you're even getting smaller than that in terms of your body size, you know, where how do you make room for that? And so apparently there are some changes with respect to the, the eyes and the teeth so uh the major challenge for miniaturized organisms is packing enough cells into a tiny form to build these complex structures and salamander cells can only be so small because they are chock full of dna their genomes range from about three to 40 times the size of the human genome so this is an organism with a, a particularly large genome and that and that genome exists in chromatin, which, you know, we're, liter we're literally talking about a size reduction of such that you're trying to find, you know, ways to pack this into this, the cells that you have available. So, you know, we usually don't think of that as a constraint, but in these organisms, they are. Um, so they have these large genomes, you know, they're, you know, you would think, well, yeah, you can, you know, DNA is small. But the cells are getting so small now that they're having problems fitting that in, into the cell. So that's the problem. Uh, now Rovito and collaborators in Slovenia in the United States have discovered the genome size tends to decrease with body size across the group of 60 salamander species. The research reported in the American Naturalist suggests that salamander genomes may evolve to make room for more cells in a miniature frame. So what these salamanders do is they reduce their genome size, and that's the way they're able to do this uh, size reduction. It's worth noting that in general, and I don't know if we've talked about it too much in this group, but there's this idea of uh, allometric scaling. So organisms can grow larger or grow smaller in a different uh, group of organi related organisms, and they use this mechanism called allometric scaling. And what that means is that the body size usually grows, you know, with maybe with environment or with <clears throat> some other ecological niche. And as the body grows, everything else grows. So the head grows and you get other body parts like the brain that grow along with it. And in this case, it's so small that you're kind of reaching the bottom level of that scaling. And so, you know, it's uh, a little bit difficult uh, you know, maybe you don't have a viable organism at a certain, you know, uh, size scale. You can have organisms that might be too big to survive as well. But in this case, what they've solved is they've solved this problem by getting rid of genes in their genome. Now you say okay. that, oh, Brad, yeah. uh, there's, there's some very interesting work that was done, I think, in the 1930s or 40s that uh, uh, is somewhat similar to this, uh, they took a salamander and made it. They made salamanders with a high ploidy, in other words, duplicates of the whole genome. Now, what this results in is larger cells. Okay, because for some, I don't think this problem's been solved yet. For some mysterious reason, the size of the cells uh, is proportional to the size of the genome. Okay. Okay. Now, the observation is, in this case, was that the animals were the same size, 
as the standard diploid. I think they got up to seven ploidy. Okay? Okay. Which means that the brain had fewer cells. The body size was the same. Okay? Right. And the animals seemed to be stupider. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. So it's it's a, it's a little bit related to this work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know, so the high ploidy had fewer brain cells and were stupid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's uh Yeah, that's an interesting uh we've talked about this before in the group I think from time to time about salamander genomes and s cell size and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is interesting work. It complements this older work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So now you, you might be asking why do we, you know, how can we get rid of DNA? Uh, we, you know, we, what what happens when we get rid of DNA? And so, you know. Uh, uh, did they do, do a test for so-called junk DNA? Is right. the junk DNA less? Right, yeah, they have, so they have, uh, uh, this idea, you know, yeah, so the genome is, isn't all, like, functional. There's a lot of DNA, like retrotransposons, that exist in the, uh, you know, they call it junk DNA, that, that terminology is always being revised and what it exactly include, is included yeah. in junk DNA. But basically what they're saying is that they're getting rid of a lot of the stuff that is not directly coding DNA. So it looks like... Uh, they say the genome-sized balloons and salamanders owning, at least in part, to abundance of repetitive DNA sequences. And that's known as retrotransposons. But they're basically things in the genome that you don't, that you don't necessarily need, but exists in the, in the DNA. And so uh, retrotransposons are things that have inserted themselves into the genome. Uh, you know, they might be of ancient origin, but they've never been selected out for various reasons. And so they, in salamanders, you have a lot of this, apparently. And okay, so, now, yeah. there's some funny predictions here. If they try to take this miniature salamander and make a pl high ploidy animal, it shouldn't survive or it should be very stupid. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, and there's nothing to prevent them from doing it. It's the, the ploidy experiments are done at the single cell uh, egg stage. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Uh, or I think the fertilized. And what you do is you prevent the cell division even though the nucleus has divided. Okay? And there are standard experiments for doing that. Now there's another funny side effect. We now know how to make a much higher human population because we are supposedly 95% junk DNA. Yeah. <laughs> could eliminate our junk DNA and then select for size, we could become very tiny and become the little Lilliputians. <laughs> <laughs> okay? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of experimenting ahead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, okay, so let's see. Uh, to explore this possibility, he collected sal salamanders in the forests of Mexico and Guatemala that belonged to a group known as the uh, Bolito Glossines. The group included salamanders spanning a wide range of sizes, from the Thorius, which is very small, to the roughly eight times longer Ismura gigantea. So this, these are, you know, a range of different sizes as well as species. Uh, the smallest salamander was the hardest to find. And they go through that. Then they say the team estimated physical size of each species based on head volume and measurements of length to nose to waist. So this is this allometry I'm talking about where you have this uh, relationship between, say, like head size, brain size, and body size. And it scales with the size of the organism. Uh, they then looked at the relationship between genome size and physical size while accounting for relatedness between species. Genome size tended to decrease as physical size decreased, suggesting that evolution may favor smaller genomes for smaller salamanders. And so, we, yeah, that goes back to the thing about changing the genome size for a salamander of a certain size. Uh, there seems to be the scaling in genome size 
that is sort of normal, I guess. Um, so the team also constructed a phylogenetic tree using previously published genetic data to reveal a genome size changed over time as salamander species diverged. The tree shows several instances of genome size reduction, including the ancestors of all living Thoria species. And so they calculated a measure called biological size for each species, which is the number of cells an organism, organism can fit within a fixed amount of space. So let's see. Uh, the number of cells an organism can fit within a fixed amount of space. I guess that's just the packing of it. Uh, if the, yeah, we talked about the DNA determining the size of the cell. So that's related to that. One species has a greater biological size than another of equal physical stature when its cells are smaller, uh, thanks to a smaller genome. Salamanders with this relatively smaller cell, with relatively smaller cells, essentially have more bi cellular building blocks available, uh, meaning they're capable of having more complex bodies. The team found that the species within that species within Thorius are actually larger in terms of biological size than some of the physically larger salamanders, perhaps helping them compensate for their miniature form. So this is uh, this is you know this kind of goes on about like how the cell size is determining, you know, there's, uh, there are two different things here. There's cell size, which can shrink down due to uh, less DNA, and then there's body size. And the idea is that if you have smaller cells, even if you have a smaller body, you can have a more or less complex uh, phenotype. And so that may have something to do with the, uh, the brain function in, in that experiment. Um, so they uh, quote Ryan Gregory from the University of Guelph, both possibilities may be true. He points to an earlier study suggesting that small genome size evolved in the dinosaur ancestors of birds before they learned to fly, as well as his own research suggesting that metabolic demands of flight cause modern day birds to continue to evolve smaller genomes. You can have the prerequisite and the enhancement. And so there are other factors that can be at play uh, this person here, Gomez Mestri, suggests that climate can have an indirect effect on genome size in frogs. Uh, and so there are a lot of causal factors for this. Um, but it, there is this phenomena of extreme miniaturization in nature. And so this is something that uh, this, this work kind of points to in salamanders, but this is more general, where you have this where you get in, in an organism, you know, that has a range of sizes, you get different species or variants that are really, really tiny. And so the question is, how do you get that tiny? I mean, <laughs> you know, you have to shrink down all of your cells and they have to function in, you know, they have to maintain their function. And so how do you get to be really, really small? Or a really, really small version of a, say, like a salamander or, you know, some other organism that's not typically that small. And so that's, okay. yeah. Brad, can I ask a question? Is there any nematode smaller than C. elegans? Um, I'm not aware of that. I, I, I know there are ones that are bigger in terms of cell size. Oh, yeah. 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 I'm not <laughs> sure. Yeah. I'm not sure if there are ones that are smaller. I've not heard of them. They're, I can check into that. Because we're, we're presuming that except for cell pairs, uh, every cell is unique in the nematode, right. which means that you couldn't reduce the number of cells. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, you can't, I guess, from C. elegans. I mean, you could have like a an common ancestor with something else that would have, um, yeah. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Yeah. Okay, but can you select C. elegans for fewer cells, for miniaturization? Hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I, I'm not really... You, 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 you run them through a culture counter to me, or something like that to measure their size. Yeah. And then select the small ones and keep breeding the small ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, like people have done experimental evolution in C. elegans and... Uh, that's actually a good organism to do that in because you have a yeah. generation length of about three days and you can just keep going and 
Uh, yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Good. <laughs> yeah. Good. You got some desk space behind you. Go ahead. No. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, not today. <laughs> so, so that, yeah, that's that paper. Um, and I think that's pretty much it for now. Um, there's this other paper that we've had for a while. Uh, Tension heterogeneity directs form and fate to pattern the myocardial wall. I don't know if this was something that Susan sent me or if I found this, um, but it's an interesting paper on... Um, how do diverse cell fates and complex forms emerge and feed back to each other to sculpt functional organs remains unclear. In the developing heart, the myocardium transitions from a simple epithelium to an intricate tissue that consists of distinct layers, the outer compact and inner trabecular layers. The effects in this process, which is known as cardiac trabe uh, trabeculation, causes cardiomyopathies uh, and embryonic lethality. Yet how tissue symmetry is broken to specify these cardiomyocytes is unknown. Here we show that local tension heterogeneity drives organ scale patterning and cell fate decisions during this uh, process in zebrafish. Uh, proliferation and cellular crowding at the tissue scale triggers tension heterogeneity among cardiomyocytes of the compact layer and drives those with higher contractility to delaminate and seed the trabecular layer. So this means that, um, let's see if there are any figures. I know that's a lot of words. It's hard to really know what they're talking about. Um, but basically you have this, what they call crowding induced tension. And so you have cells that are crowding together and they're uh, generating this tension force. And so this is triggering another process called cardiomyocyte delamination. And so I don't know if you can see these, this, this is, these are pretty small figures, but they kind of show a little bit of what's going on in the embryo. Um, I'm wondering if there's a better figure for this. Oh, it probably is not. Um, but yeah, so that's another interesting paper. Um, so yeah, they get into a bunch of different genetic experiments here in the paper. So, you know, there are things, you, for those of you who don't read uh, the biological literature much at all or don't have any experience with it, uh, you know, people will do these different experiments where they, well, uh, where they will take out different genes or knock them down in some way um, that removes their function. And then the idea is in these mutants or in these uh, knockdown models, can you observe the same process or what's the difference between, say, like a normally functioning uh, organism and something with this, um, you know, this knockdown generated? And so, you know, you can see different, you know, see different variations and different things. And if you get the pathway or, you know, if you understand the pathway, you can knock down different genes in that pathway and see what's going on in terms of the in terms of the genetics and things like that. So that's actually quite common in biology to see those kind of studies. Um, and it, you know it should tell you something about the process. Um, so that's that's that paper. I have a bunch of things that I've kind of collected over the last couple of weeks. You know we usually don't have time to go through all of them, but um, I'm going to kind of leave the rest of them there. And if you want access to this folder, I will put it in the chat for you. Okay. Um, next order of business is, I think we'll shift to talking about different manuscripts that we have sitting around and things that we need to, to clear, the, clear off the decks in the next couple weeks, you know, months, whatever. Uh, these two I'm going to talk about first are due for the special issue of Biosystems, I believe. So this is the stuff that I'm working on with Dick and with uh, George Mikhailovsky, who's not doesn't attend the meetings. But uh, this is the this uh, geological events during the Boring Billion. So we have this paper that we've uh, been talking about. Uh, there's this area of evolution called the Boring Billion. So you go from, you know, the last universal common ancestor, which is one of the first 
organisms in the history of Earth. It's very uh, simple. Uh, and then you go maybe about a billion years before you start to get um, more complex organisms. And so the question is, is what's in this billion year period? Um, so this is a table that I think Dick assembled where you have different times estimating the boring billion because we don't really know the exact times. We have to estimate well, George, it. George did that table. Oh, George. Okay, George did this table. So, you know, we don't really know when exactly it happened. It's not like a calendar where we can look at it and check off, you know, when something started and ended. We can estimate from molecular data. Um, I don't know if there's a lot of fossil data for this period simply because of the nature of the organisms, but we can get a sense of it. And so we can get these estimates. So the, these estimates then are, um, you know, they look pretty variable. I mean, they look like there's, we're trying to think of how to average out this interval. Like, you know, uh, how do you determine the beginning? How do you determine the end? You could use an average. Um, you know, there, I, I'm probably going to, I'm going to do some work on this where I'll look at the, I'll match these dates up to a phylogeny, which is a tree of life, and try to see if we can find, like, you know, uh, maybe define some of these dates on the tree and see what it looks like. Uh, but that's something I'm going to be doing over the holiday. Um, so the boring billion term did not exist, uh, you know, the, it's basically the dullest time in Earth's deep, Earth's deep history. So now, I think know. it refers to lack of fossils. Okay, but people have been finding some fossils in that period, which is also which is literature will have to find. <laughs> I'm going to make a note here. Yeah. So yeah, I mean the the fossil record is going to be pretty sparse in any case, but. It's basically when there is nothing really going on in terms of uh, innovation and evolution. So after this time, you know, you get this great diversification of organisms and it didn't take a billion years. I mean, it was like, you know, pretty quickly relative to that time. So, you know, the question is, uh, what is the what's going on? So, I mean, some of the things that were going on were, you know, you had the uh, the atmosphere was of a different composition. So, you know, we had different uh, compositions of the atmosphere. You had something called Snowball Earth, which was where the Earth got really cold uh, due to a series of events. And then, um, so, I mean, these sorts of things were sort of playing a role in, in maintaining this period of boringness. And so, you know, there, here's a review of some of the things from the fossil record um setting up you know establishing this set this era um so it looks like a lot of good work here um and then we have features that may be en route to mosaic or regulating embryo animals uh so this is from hymen 1940 so i take this as dick's uh work because of the hymen reference um so is that right? <laughs> yeah, I pulled pull it out. It's a 1940 book, and you have to realize it's before DNA, before any uh, phylogeny by genomes, etc. But uh, there's a lot of good pictures, a lot of discussion. Yeah. Uh, things you're not going to find easily in more modern literature. Yeah, definitely. This is really good. Um, this has a a lot of different species and their features here. Yeah, so. I have to scan the pictures, the figures that I uh, that I quote there. Okay. Put yeah. them in so you can see what they're about. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah. yeah this is yeah, this is really good. So that's that's gonna be forthcoming and and then we can see steps towards something called differentiation waves and features of the protozoa in table one. So this is where uh, we're going back to protozoa and proposing that there's something going on that looks like what's going on in development in their descendant organisms. So differentiation waves are something we find in development, and then we but we find precursors of these in much 
earlier uh, single cell organisms. And so, or I guess you also have colonies of cells. Like we said, you know, you have single cells and then there were these aggregates of cells. And then, you know, you didn't step directly from a single cell to like multicellular organisms. There were these intermediate steps, like a bunch of different cells that were identical and so forth. So, um, and so that's, that's, yeah, that's this paper. Um, it's like we have some pretty good references here too. So that's due pretty soon um, at the end of January. Um, next paper is the periodicity of the embryo or in the embryo. Uh, this is something that is going to be due soon. Um, I made a lot of progress on it, uh, the abstract, the introduction. So this is, again, the paper where there's an argument being made that there's this tempo and mode in development, that there's this, uh, you know, you can look at, like, development as having this mode of cell division and cell differentiation. And so to, to sort of show this, uh, this phenomenon. We have a bunch, a couple of data sets. Uh, we have the C. elegans data set and we have a zebrafish data set. And these two data sets are um, the cell tracking data sets where they track nuclei throughout development and they provide, you know, information about when the cell was born, uh, some differentiation information, and it, even its position in a, in a space that we can normalize and create graphs and analysis from. So we have the C. elegans data set, we have the zebrafish data set, and then we also have some numeric uh, results that are, you know, simulations of, of a cell division process. And so then we go through the results and we, I, I redid these figures. The ones that I've shown in previous meetings were not very clear. These are a little bit clearer in terms of the, you know, uh, some of the data the distributions of the data. So this is C. elegans. This is uh, these are cell divisions in the in the embryo. These are cell differentiations both in the embryo and in the post-embryonic developmental period. Uh, this is uh, these are intervals between cell divisions. So you get these intervals between cell divisions, and this is something we discuss in the paper as to what this might mean. Um, then you go to zebrafish, and in the zebrafish, you have to measure it a little bit differently. You know, the way that data is presented, you have a lot more cells. So you're looking at the total number of cells in any given point, and you're looking at the number of new cells in that population. And so this is the distribution of that. And you can see this very uh, interesting pattern of like this very strong periodicity here. And then at some point in development, it breaks down, and there's this aperiodic. Uh, uh, division pattern. So, you know, why is that? Well, we don't really know, but we've kind of, point, you know, pinpointed this in the graph and discussed this. And then this is, of course, this sort of the same thing we did with C. elegans, but because it's measured a little bit differently, you have to basically look at the frequency of, relative frequency of birth rate across developmental time. So it's a little bit different, but it gives a, maybe a similar type of distribution because there's a sort of a long tail going on. So we have we have that, and that's discussed in the paper. These are intervals between peaks. So now taking the peaks of these different fluctuations and defining it in a certain way, we can get these graphs, and it's discussed in the paper. This is C. elegans, and this is zebrafish. So zebrafish, you tend to have this multimodal distribution for whatever reason. Um, I can't remember why that is. I, I, it might be in the paper. Uh, then, but what we do then, we go a step further in zebrafish, and we create this embryo network, which is uh, we've we done we've done research on this where we've looked at these, where we look at the cells and we look at their proximity to one another, and we can actually get a distance between them, and then threshold that uh, data set so that we create sort of a connectivity between cells. So if cells are pretty close to one another, they're connected. If they're further apart, they're not connected. And then we get this graph here, which shows that, you know, we have a lot of, uh, there's a certain area of the cells that, you know, where there's like tight clustering and there are other parts of the embryo where 
there isn't. And so you get these modules of uh, connectivity here. And so that translates into this 3D graph, which shows a lot of the sort of what's going on in space, which is that there's this cluster of cells in the middle that are forming, that there, there's a cluster right down the middle that have a very high degree of clustering, which means they have a lot of closely packed neighbors, and then some cells further out that are a little bit less dense, and then cells even further out, which are very far apart. And so we can already start to see like, so maybe some of the precursors of, you know, uh, a differentiation in this pattern. Um, and so then we get down to this simulation, which I won't go through, but I think I talked about it a couple weeks ago where you're just measuring the number of cell divisions over time and you can use different statistical distributions to figure out, you know, to generate different patterns of divisions over time. And we discussed this model. I'm not done with this yet, but there, you know, there's some interesting uh, findings here. And then this is a supplemental figure showing an embryo network in, an, in an, a model of an embryo. It's a 3D uh, cartoon, but just giving people an idea of what that looks like. And then we have a, I need to add, we need to add references into this. We have like maybe, I have it numbered weird, but basically are 20 references or so. And so we need probably twice that number uh, to be a viable thing. So, I mean, you know, I, I like to have references. I always think when there are very few references that like, well, you could probably put more in. So it's very much, yeah, it's very much a, it's, it's, it's come far a long way since I last showed this to people. So, so. Uh, am I here? Yeah, you can, I can hear you. Yeah, so basically I was looking at the image that you've shown, like where you are saying like the periodicity, periodicity is being uh, uh, somewhat distorted after some time. The, uh, if you can go to that image uh, where you have separated out from the middle, okay, uh, like and that orange patch is there. So I guess like the periodicity, periodicity may be there. We can find it out, like, but it is not on the same scale that we are looking right now. So if we you uh, if we can like uh, uh can go up this one? Uh, no 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 a little up. Uh, oh, yeah yeah this one this one this yeah. one this one. So yeah. you said like uh, the periodicity is like uh, being altered in the next half hour. So I guess like there is still a few periodicity that we can observe, but we have to change the scale for that and. I think like uh, this can be uh, like put in the next graph and you can observe still some patterns because like uh, the scale is totally uh, different as you can see in the first half in the last half it is going up to 200 yeah so there might be some periodicity there as well yeah. not as clear as that but yes some periodicity. yeah that's yeah, I'm going to look into that a little bit, too. I could put it into MATLAB and get it to um, do some signal processing on it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we could do that. Oh, like, oh, I'm uh, now I think like I'm oh, completely recovered from COVID. So, like, if you want, like, I can contribute to these papers as well. Oh yeah, yeah. This this paper, you know, we could run a we could run an analysis. I can send you a link to the data, and you can uh, look at it and see. Um, yeah, I think this I think the zebrafish data might you might be able to do signal processing on uh, the sea elegans. Yeah, you might be able to do it on the sea elegans too. Um, so yeah. Yes, so see, we have already worked on like best and sea elegans, so it won't be a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Great. That yeah, that's that's good. Um, so this is coming along, and we're, you know, um, it's yeah, it's still a bit short in terms of uh, word length too. So we could add a couple more things to it. I think it would be fine. Um, anyways, that's good. Uh, and then the final paper, and I know Mayuk was here, but he left. Um, there we had this uh, 
we, we had the Journal of Open Source Software paper, and it was Ujwal and myself and Mayuk, and the, the people at Open Source Software didn't like it because it wasn't like notable enough. Um, I, I think they're looking for more things like things that are going to be broadly used by the community. So I don't know, you know, there there's like scientific software that's like very central to certain fields. And so maybe that's what they're looking for. But anyways, uh, I told my, you know, what we'll do f with the paper. And, uh, you know, it's not a lot of work so far, but it's it's actually, you know, it's, it's sort of a description of his software that he made. And then I put in some description of Devo Learn, the platform. So you have the platform, the software, and then... Um, you know, we didn't really talk too much about some of the other, you know, we didn't get into depth about the Devo Learn platform in terms of like what's what it consists of and all the different parts. So I was thinking what we could do with that is start to expand it out into something that's a lot more uh, descriptive of the Devo Learn platform. Uh, yes, sir. Like uh, when I was going through that paper recently, I also like observed uh, the paper is not as much descriptive as it has to be. Like in the development platform itself, uh, we have lots of things going on. Yeah. So, uh, like, I will uh, start working on that, uh, I guess, from today. Okay. And we can complete it after, uh, after like, on Saturday or something, I will complete my part. Okay. Yeah, you know, what would be good for you is, like, if, you know, the stuff that you did this summer with uh, reorganizing DevoZoo and, like, the different species-specific models, if you could spell out more clearly what those are, like how those, you see those fitting together and what those consist of, basically describing what you did. Uh, we, you know, we can have different parts of it. Like, you know, I, I think the problem is it's, it's, you know, it's kind of hard to kind of describe every part of it. But if we scale it up to describing the Devil Learn platform, what we want to have essentially is a paper that kind of spells out each part of it. So if I go to the repository, I don't have to dig around and try to figure out how it fits together. Um, and then, you know, we can publish this uh, and it can spell out everything in the platform. So then it can drive future development. So we have like the, you know, Devo Learn software. We have uh, the C. Elegans software that uh, for Open Devo, what we called Open Devo Cell from last year, we had uh, the Devo Zoo part. And so all those parts are kind of, I don't know if they're uh, fully described uh, right now. And they're not, I know they're not in that paper because we were trying to make it compact for that venue. But now that we don't have the limitations of, of the Journal of Open Source Software, now we can make it, you know, a much longer paper. We can, you know, pull, you know, pull things apart and kind of describe them in a little bit more detail. And I know my knock contacted me on Slack and he said, uh, you know, I don't really understand. I'd love to contribute to Diva Learn. Uh, I'd like to understand what's going on with it a bit more in more detail. Like he wasn't totally clear about what what the goal was. So my knock, do you, do you want to talk about that experience or what, what would be your suggestion for making that clearer? Hello, Bradley, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Hello? Yeah, hi. Yeah, so you were talking about the Devo Learn, right? Yeah. The library that we... Yeah, so uh, as far as I saw the library, like, I, I dived into the code a bit. So from what I saw, I can conclude that it's, it's still in its early stage and it still needs a lot of work to be done. So I guess we have a lot of room for improvement for the library, I guess. Yeah. So that's it. Like we need, we need a lot more work to be done on the software. Yeah. 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 You know, it's, it's, it's the nature of open source. We get, we start off and then we just keep working on it. And, um, but yeah, I think in terms of like, when you, you go to the repository, you know, there, there is a, like, and what I'm talking about is a paper that would be like a preprint where we would release new versions of the paper as we kind of develop things. So it's not like it's not a paper set in stone, but we'd like, I'd like to have something that's, you know, uh, descriptive that people can go to and say, this is the current state of what we have. 
And so uh, if people want to add on, they can just say, oh, yeah, this is an area uh, that we can add on to. And it's, you know, we can point, they can point to that part where, you know, oh, in this uh, directory or in this area, I can definitely contribute. I think that would be a good way to go. And I think it would be like, it would, you know, foster, if not, you know, development, some adoption. And of course, with open source, you're adopting and people who are adopting tend to uh, start to contribute to it, you know, if they need to, to improve it or if they need to like add in modules. Um, and yeah, uh, another thing that I would like to add is that like at the DevoLearn library, right? It's like, it's only like seven months or eight months old. So considering that uh, we have come a very long way. Oh yeah. And I like a, a year's worth of work from now and we'll be, we'll definitely reach somewhere. So that's what I'm expecting from the next year. Oh yeah. Maybe. yeah. We'll be growing a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. And then the other thing, and I know <laughs> my oak left, so I was going to talk about this, but, and I don't know if I have it in here, but well, I might as well talk to, about with you guys about this, is that we're starting off with uh, the next round of, of Google Summer of Code. So for 2021, and they start the process very early. They started in, in late January, I think is the time that we have to have the proposals in. Um, so let me see if I can find the proposal on GitHub. I know I put it up. Um, I will share my screen in a minute when I find this. Um, but I wanted to go over this a little bit. Okay, I got it. So let me share my screen. And so this would follow up on like developing DevoLearn. Uh, as Minox said, we have a lot of opportunities. And so one of the things is to have a good proposal for uh, GSOC because GSOC is a good place to start developing things. So uh, Mayuk has already seen these, obviously. This is his document that he sent me. Uh, and I invite people, if, if you wanna be involved with this, if you wanna, if you have suggestions for changes, uh, this is the link here and you can actually add a, you know, pull request on this, or I think a lot of you might already have access to it. But basically, if you want to make changes or suggest new things, you can issue a pull request to this uh, markdown file. So we have a couple of ideas here, and these are all largely related to DevaLearn. Uh, the first is model robustness. So uh, this idea that we, uh, just improve performance on the DevoLearn platform itself, the one that Mayo uh, created last year. So there's there are ways to test for model robustness. And what he's saying is that the project would basically be uh, organized around this instead of just kind of like trying to um, run, you know, like data sets, you would actually look at these things to test to see how robust the model was and then improve upon it. Uh, where the statistics show that it needs improvement. So there are all sorts of different methods that one can use. The project, I guess, would be running through each of these methods and having someone go through and test it and see how they could improve the platform. Um, so there's that idea, and, it, and it's not like written up very formally, so I'm not really sure what that would look like in the end. It might, it, that may be enough See, the thing you have to remi remember about GSOC projects is that, you know, you have to make it so that it's, they have like a criterion for usefulness. And so they want to make sure that the student is getting like a useful experience. They want to make sure there's enough work there for them. So this would have to be fashioned into something like we would test the model for robustness and then where there's less, you know, where things are less robust, if we see that the pr model's having particular trouble in these areas on different data sets, then we would try to propose solutions to that or fix, you know, come up with a solution. Um, the second uh, one is usability. And so this is a general usability. This is kind of like what uh, uh, Ojewal was doing last year um, in that, you know, there's this idea that we need a better uh, usability strategy for 
Diva learned. And I think Mayo Care was talking about um, documentation for the platform and for the Diva Learn software in particular. But, you know, that's something, the usability idea, I think, has legs. I think we can kind of figure out, like, you know, a, a, bit, a, a, bit, a bit more sort of robust usability strategy for the entire platform and then have that person do something very specific within that. So he's talking about like having a place to host documentation, like Gitbook, which is a, a way to host documentation or like a read the docs type thing. And so then you have that, uh, you can also um, add use cases. So use cases are things where you add in like support for more species or uh, you can have other species where they have a deep pre-trained deep learning model. So basically expanding Diva Learn to specialize in other species um, because right now we've trained it mostly on C. elegans and there's an opportunity maybe to expand that to, you know, zebrafish or drosophila or some other species. Uh, or model organism where there's a lot of data and so how matters maybe yeah yeah <laughs> it's just yeah we i think that's yeah and we'll have all these data um so it's a matter of like getting you know getting a project together where we can say we have data we have a way to like for the person to come in and just start testing data testing the program itself and then we can um you know then, oh. Yeah. Go ahead. So like, uh, I have like a uh, few points. Like, uh, in this proposal, that uh, uh, can you go to the proposal? Yeah. <coughs> uh, sorry. Uh, so the proposal is that like uh, the model of this uh, parameters that you are using right now, uh, it's not uh, worthy like for the whole GSOC project, like. The K4, K4 cross validation or certified splits and like uh, using an ensemble uh, models. Uh, so I think like my means here, like gradient boosting or something. So these uh, might not be uh, able to uh, like extend throughout the sum of code. Like, oh, like it is, oh, I don't know, like oh, work for week two or three, like at max. Yeah. Um, well, that was my, yeah. So, my understanding too is that the summer they're going to uh, shrink the GSOC pro program down a bit. So last summer it was like, I think, how many weeks did we have? Like 14 or something. Yeah. I think it's going to shrink down by about half this year. I was reading, I don't remember exactly the details, but they had sent out some emails earlier and they're proposing that. I don't know if that's going to actually happen, but they're not, it's not going to be as long. But you're uh, you're quite right about the uh, the the amount of work that this involves. I mean, this could be just like a weekend where I just put these things in and say, "Oh yeah, here's are some recommendations." So when we write this yeah. up, we need to make it like you're gonna do. You're gonna start here, maybe take some different types of data sets, maybe from different species, and then test the you know the robustness. And we'll probably find that there's you know if we add in more data that it's going to be. You know, there's going to be something there. And then from there, we can have them do something that's, um, you know, like improve upon the model. But that's that in even there, it's hard because, you know, just saying like, you'll you'll see what happens isn't really going to cut it. <laughs> you know, like, uh, well, you know, I don't know. Well, we'll see what happens when we uh, test the data. Maybe it's the model is very robust and maybe it doesn't isn't robust at all. I don't think the GSOC people are going to go for that very well, but... Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, so, like, uh, me and, like, uh, do you, uh, if you remember, uh, we, me and Ashwin have worked on Brasilia project. Yeah. And we were, like, uh, discussing, like, uh, I think last week itself, when we are, like, uh, uh, like, we are realizing all of the research projects that we have done so far. So, we are uh, planning, like, uh, we can extend uh, Brasilia project itself this year like we have uh, left the work by identifying like where the cells are and how the cells are segmented like there are a lot of work to be do like the centroid uh, where the centroid and how is the motion is turning and like uh, making uh, the prediction of the motion that is being carried out 
and other techniques like so i think like uh, a proposal can around this also be included like if possible because it has like a work uh, for around one and a half or two months it sounds good yeah yeah it's definitely yeah. uh is there like yeah you, you can probably uh you know write up like put together some slides and sort of show what that would entail maybe uh, yeah. in the new so, year like, yeah. even like if you want to put uh this proposal with like uh they were warm uh, we can go with like oral as well like because there is work on that so we need to be done like uh, to make it a complete work actually right yeah yeah definitely if you have so if you have uh, ideas you can well you can send them to me in slack if if that's better or you can <laughs> commit them to this repo just notes or just like a a little bit of a description a short description in words I mean, you know, it's, um, yeah, this is a pretty rough draft here of what we would do for a project. So definitely if you have ideas for this, uh, especially in terms of targeting different species, different data sets, because, you know, we're going to, we don't want to have people searching for things like, I think this year we want to really have, give them something like right off the bat and say, here's the data and, and use this, uh, especially since we have a lot of data now that we've been talking about <laughs> like the salamanders the uh basilaria yeah sure that's great thank you so all right that i think that's it for this meeting um have a happy new year and this is the last meeting of the year uh i'll be sending an email about the first meeting of next year which will be uh probably in january maybe the first or second week um and that at that meeting, I'm going to have a presentation, a summary for 2020. So we're going to go over everything that happened in 2020, uh, some of the highlights, uh, just, you know, maybe planning for this coming year. Um, and you'll be surprised, I think, to see what we actually did over the course of this last year. I think it's been quite a, a nice year for uh, on a number of fronts. And... Um, Thank you for everyone for attending the meetings and sticking with it. And uh, even, you know, through the COVID crisis, everyone's been pretty, <laughs> pretty active. So I'm glad to see that everyone's been doing very well here in the group. And so um, thanks for attending and uh, talk to you later. Have a good new year.